Randall is here. What was the question? It is, are you in the country and at the meeting? <laughs> Olaf, uh, it's a shared session. The um, I-meeting doesn't start until 11.30. The I-meeting? There's a second session after uh, this one. Are you good to go? It is one minute past ten. It's time to begin. Uh, welcome to the very exclusive SLIM working group. Um, we were going for opulence rather than a room fitting of the actual size of the group. Um, so, uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll begin. To, we're going to have a pretty short meeting today. Uh, we'll, we'll, we've got a few things to go through, um, mostly around the two documents that we have. We'll, we'll go through the agenda quickly. Uh, Lucas is our Jabber scribe. Thank you very much for that. Uh, we do not have a, a, a normal scribe. Would somebody like to be the normal scribe? Oh, so many hands, so much choice. Oh, why, thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you so much for that. Any method you prefer is fine. Um, uh, so uh, our Jabber is slim, slim at jabber.itf.org. Uh, Bernard and I, your chairs, both here today, which is great. Uh, right, Jabber Scribe, we've pa we're passing around a blue sheet, just one blue sheet. Um, make sure you get it. I will check at the end. We have we have one's out, so I don't think we need another one. Um, we we do have at least one remote presenter. Gunnar's going to be presenting remotely towards the end of the meeting. Uh, so please speak clearly and slowly and say your name into the mic. I, I like when people do slow name statements into the mic. It seems to be a thing at IETF, which you have to say your name really, really quickly into the mic in the most inaudible fashion. So um, you get, a, actually you don't get any awards for saying your name slowly, it's just nice. Uh, cool. All right. So this is the note. Well, this is how we do things here at the IETF. Uh, if you can't abide by said rules, then please let us know, I guess, or leave or one of those things. Um, it's very small, but it's it's on the website. So please, if you put IETF note well into your favorite search engine, you'll be able to find it and press control plus until it's at a font size, which is good for you to read. Cool. Um, so uh, a little note about our expectations with respect to IPR declaration. There is something called RFC 6701, which is sanctions available for application to violators of ITF IPR policy. And these are some quotes from it that we'd like to remind the audience of. The impact of an IPR disclosure has on the smooth working of the ITF is directly related to how late in the process the disclosure is made. The IPR situation is considered at key times, such as adoption of the document and during last call. The SLIM Working Group will be going to Working Group last call on several of these documents shortly. And our expectation is that we will receive IPR declarations no later than the end of that last call. Uh, not conforming to the ITF's IPR policy undermines the work of the ITF and sanctions ought to be applied against offenders and Working Group chairs are empowered to take action. So we'd like to put people on notice that we are considering the application of RFC 6701, um, and we would like those disclosures to be made in the timely way that we expect. Brian Rosen, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, on behalf of Bernard. Uh, cool. Thank you for that. Awesome. Uh, so, so yeah, we have a 
like I said, we have a brief agenda today. Uh, we're going to have a quick overview on Slim, uh, the Slim Docs. Nick has a, a presentation to do on uh, Slim multi multi-land content. Uh, oh, sorry, I was supposed to put zero one there. It's a zero one, not a zero zero. I'm apologies. That's my mistake. And uh, Randall doesn't have slides, but we'll just perhaps give a quick verbal update on um, on uh, on multi on negotiating human language. Yes, that second one. Then we'll, we're gonna have a next steps conversation, uh, what's happening with the documents, uh, any new work that we might want to do, and we have uh, a lot of overflow time. Cool, all right. So I think we'll move over to um, Nick, if you're okay to present, that's fine. Uh, I'll go to the slides, all our documents, obviously on Data Tracker, if you want to have a look at the actual document, you know where to go, Slim, Data Tracker, IETF, in your favorite search engine, we'll find it. Cool, all right. Okay, um, so this is just a quick uh, status update. Next slide, please. Um, there were a few comments from the last meeting. Uh, that's um, that's resulted in, a, in a, a new version of the document. Uh, the, the main comment that uh, came back resulted in um, quite a big change to the structure of the multi-language message itself. And the main change now is that the uh, the first part of the multilingual uh, layout is a, a single text plane part. Um, and after that, then you've got one or more message slash IFC 822 or message slash global language parts. And they were originally, uh, it was stated in the document that they could be anything you liked, any mon type you liked, and that wasn't ideal because um, each of those parts had um, subject fields. So the idea of the message RFC 822 was that um, the legacy clients will definitely recognize that uh, there's... I don't think you're talking into the mic. Is that better? Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, okay, so the, the message RFC 822 change um, was mainly so that the subject field can be picked up because there's a subject field in each of those message parts, the language message parts anyway. Um, so that's now been updated on the document and uh, the language independent part which goes right to the end, that's also a message IFC 822 type uh, or message global as long as it matches the, the types for the other language parts then that's great. Um, but with that part, there isn't a subject because because that's in a meant to be in a language that's completely um, non-specific. Um, and the reasoning reasoning behind the text plane for the first part, the multilingual preface, is that um, that the the reasoning for that part to be there in the first place is very similar to the MIME preface. So that it's only ever gonna be seen by clients that that aren't compliant and don't understand what the multilingual MIME subtype is. So it needs to be just as simple as possible and text plain, I think is a, a good one that, that has tested really well in emails I've been sending around. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> in the previous version, the security considerations were non-existent. Uh, that was picked up um, in one of the comments. And so I've now updated that. So the, the main concern that was raised um, was for spam filters that, that didn't delve into each individual sub part of the message. I'm not sure how likely this, that's going to be because that seems quite a naive approach. But um, that's now been changed. That security consideration section has been changed so that it does at least mention that as a risk. Um, so that was, that was a good comment to, to get back at the end of last session. Um, so as you can see, that's the, the new version is 01 on the end. 
Um, and I've added three quite detailed examples with the new formatting um, and the updated security considerations uh, section. Next slide, please. Um, I have been doing some testing with that new format. Um, it's worked pretty well, um, but I would like to do a little bit more testing using the examples directly out of the uh, internet draft just to be absolutely sure that they they do test well. So I'll send those through to the list of volunteers that I asked for last time. And I'm also I'm going to send it to the slim list itself so everyone can have some fun. Um, there was one concern still that I had about the security considerations, and that was that you could potentially have an impersonation issue where um, because each of the parts is a, a message RFC 822, it could have um, from fields that could potentially say something different to the, the very outermost top level from field. Um, so that's something I, I think I should put in. I'm, I'm not sure how likely anyone would would try to take advantage of that, but that's something that I want to highlight just to make sure that people have, have that in mind when they implement something. Um, there was also a um, comment from last time about contacting some, some of the multinational large mail providers and getting them involved with doing some preliminary testing and working towards potential implementations. I'm not sure if now is the right time to actually contact those people and, and get them involved or whether it's it should be after the RFC is published and then changes that that they recommend could be applied as a, a later version. Uh, so maybe some feedback on that would be ideal. Uh, and as always, the discussions uh, have been going on in the Slim working group. There's not a lot of activity going on, so I think we're pretty much near the end now. But that's the best place, I think, because then uh, wherever you are in the world, you can just join in. It doesn't have to be at the actual event. So that's pretty much it from me. Thanks. Cool. Thank you, Nick. Does anyone have any questions for Nick about the draft or comments? Uh, Brian Rosen, to that to the last point, I mean, the ITF is, uh, you know, rough consensus and running code, so now is much better than later. Um, okay. So if we could get folks to participate, that that would be great. Um, I think you you got the chicken and egg, right? Which side has to be running before the other side is willing to participate, I think, is the, is the problem. Um, I, I, I certainly personally know some folks who would like to have this work. Um, and they generate mail, but they don't own the infrastructure, right? They just use the infrastructure. So I think it's easy to get people who would like to get this to work yeah. to try it on large mail lists, but they wouldn't be willing to do it unless both the, the system that they use to send mail and their, their target mail lists uh, recipients, clients could both use it. And, and so I think that that we, you know, we, we have, a, in order to get it to work, we got a lot of work to do, but maybe we can all work, you know, grab the people we know and yeah. see if we can get them to, 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 to try these implementations. Because I, I know that there are lots of people who want this. Yeah. Um, and, <clears throat> and so it's a question of how we get it deployed. Thank okay. you. I think Nathaniel and John Levine have, offered some contact details of, of those kind of people. So um, I haven't approached those two yet, though. Oh, Alexi Malkov, yeah, I just, uh, there are some people from Google who are going to be in UTA working group today, so you, they might be good okay. people to talk to, you know, about, you know, whether they would be interested to help you test this and... Yeah, which working group was that? UTA. UK. okay, thanks. Okay. Great, yeah, I'm just writing that down for the actions for everyone. Cool, thank you so much, Nick. Right, Randall, it's time for you to give a nice update on your draft. Or, or sit there talking. 
that's also fine. Right. Um, oh. Look at that magic. Right, Randall, yes, please give a very small verbal update on your draft, if that's OK. Uh, so there were some uh, editorial revisions made in a result, result of comments that were received from the previous version. Uh, no technical changes. That's nice and short and sweet. I like that. Um, how's your security consideration section looking? I think it looks pretty good. Okay, that's good. But obviously, you know, I I try to I try to put more in than than a lot of people do in their security and privacy considerations, so that I, I try to head off um, lots of nitpicky comments later on. Um, but obviously, I'm very happy to entertain any further comments that people have on it. One tells me, as a chair, I need to ask such questions. So. Things are done. Cool. All right. Um, holding on. I, I know Guna has uh, some stuff that, but that's he's talking in the AOB. So holding on Guna's comments. Um, does anybody else have questions about this draft for um, for Rand or Tor negotiating human language in the real time draft? We're getting through it. Cool. Thank you so much for that, Randall. Awesome. All right. So I will switch back over to the agenda. Um, our next topic is the next steps for these drafts. So Bernard and I have been speaking about this and it looks like this is a good time to move the drafts into working group last call. Um, do you want, are you happy to do a hum for that or are you just happy uh, to sit? Well, probably. Yeah, okay. Um, that sounds like a good idea. So clear your throats, everyone. Um, uh, so we'll, we'll first talk about the draft that Nick was uh, that Nick was, Nick took us through the multiple language content type uh, for hum. If you agree that this should be moving into working group last call now, that's. A, well, that, how about humming if you think it should not be in working group last call? Now? Yeah. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. Learning every day. Randall Gellens, I just had one question about moving um, uh, multi line content type into yeah. last call. And that's it. Nick, you mentioned that you were, you were going, if I understand you, you said you were going to be making some changes to the security consideration section. So my question is based on the extent of those changes, should we wait for that revision and go to work, working group last call based on that? So adding items to the security considerations in particular, yeah. Just because Nick said that he was revising that. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think the summary is basically we'll wait till your revision and. Yeah, this is uh, Nick Tomkinson. Um, I will be changing the security considerations. So um, um, it's adding another paragraph. It's not uh, not a huge. Bunch of text. This is Barry Lee, but how uh, how soon will you turn that around? Um, it can be within a couple of days. So it's this week, definitely. So then we might start working group last call at the. Uh, at the end of the meeting, the end of the IETF meeting, yeah? Yeah, if you're happy with that, that's fine. Um, great, thank you so much for that, Nick. All right, I'll um, note that down at the end of the, of item nine six. Oh, um, let's, yeah, so let's rerun it. Are we, okay, so hum now if you are happy with the plan being that Nick will add his items to security. Con to con oh, oh. Hum now if you object to beginning working group last call at the end of the week, assuming that Nick posts a revision. Yeah, what, what Barry said. <laughs> what Barry said now. Hmm. Oh no, sorry. Well, now I'm getting confused. Okay, hum if you object. If you object to what Barry said, yes. Woohoo! Thank you, Barry. 
It's an uphill struggle, you know. Um, okay, cool. All right. So, uh, right, let's move on to the negotiating human language in real time communications draft. Uh, this is something we've been discussing on the list for a long time. We seem to resolve some issues that we had on the list. So, it's a good time to move to working group last call. Um, I do want to take, take that harm. Gunas on the. Is are we getting somebody no, talking? Button. Why should I no. push the red button? <laughs> Gunnar, you're up. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, before we take uh, this into last call, I think we would like a new revision. Uh, Randall agreed to make changes uh, already in 8th of April and we haven't seen any and we also concluded that the uh, all the discussion about the Lang attribute should be deleted. So can we see a new version before we go into last call? Uh, again, uh, this is Randall Gallens. I did take your comments into consideration. The revision that I posted, the, the one that's up there, did take into consideration your comments that some of the text was uh, either overly specific or confusing. So I, I did tone down the discussion of the previous Lang, um, and I did uh, make a few other minor changes along those areas. Uh, I know you did send another Word document. I've been reviewing that. Um, but I think that we can go to working group last call on this version, and then if you any if you have additional comments, you know we can take that as working group last call comments. I mean, I'm happy to make further changes. I just don't see anything that is a uh, that that needs to be done. You know, if you object, let let me know. Cool. Um, yeah, thank I, you for that. It's all depending on how how clean we shall have the the version before we make the last call. I didn't see the changes you say you made. The, the long discussion about the invalidity of the Lang attribute is still there, for example. And the, but that has, there is still a discussion about the existing Lang attribute um, as justification for what we're doing. It's informative, it's not normative, and it's based on the understanding that we had, and I did make revisions to that in view of your comments. If you go and look um, at the data tracker history with the side-by-side -side diffs, you can see the changes that were made in that section and into that text. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. I think, uh, uh, Bernard, you can shout if you feel otherwise, but I think the uh, the plan of going to working group last call and taking action, uh, taking any more comments that, on that as working group last call comments is sufficient. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll go on that on the basis of um, the hum. And uh, so the learning curve has been completed. I'm going to ask, does anyone object to going to working group last call on this draft? Please hum now. Fantastic. So we'll move uh, the real-time draft to working group last call. Great. Uh, thanks so much for that. So uh, let me just pop back over to our agenda. Uh, so we'll we'll go. How long do we spend in working group last call, Bernard? Uh, well, I guess we'll for both of these. I, I think we just said we'll try to do this by the end of the week, begin it, and then. Uh, I mean, we, the minimum, I guess, is two weeks, right? And we could do it longer if people, you know, it's summer, so perhaps a month um, would be my suggestion. I don't know what others think. Three weeks? Yeah, so we'll, we'll come up with specific specifics about Obviously, people should send their comments to the list. That we always do that. Uh, we're, we'll talk about whether they can submit them as issues and all of that kind of administrivia. But that's the general general plan. 
yes, actually, regards to this, I did want to ask a question. We do need to work on issues. Um, we're trying to work out which is the best way to submit issues. <clears throat> if you have any major objections to use, we, we have two possible methods right now, using GitHub for our issues or using the IETF tracker, issues tracker. So if you have objections to either, um, maybe post them on the list or tell us directly. If you feel really strongly, you can go to the mic, but um, let us know directly which, which is something you prefer. We have a GitHub repo. But yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. yeah, hopefully we, we won't have that many issues that it actually becomes a really important thing, <laughs> which one we use, but we'll see. Brilliant. Cool. Um, so I put a new work question mark item into that list um, also. So, I, I, but I guess we could possibly discuss that maybe out after Gunnar's slides. So Gunnar, you have some slides that you want to go through. So we'll get them up on the screen for you and you could do them now. So. Okay, thanks. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on Gunnar for one yep. second. We just have a question. <laughs> I, I, I'm just, just for the minutes. I, I'm confused of whether we approved working group last call for the for use cases. We specifically talked about the other two drafts, and I don't, I didn't understand whether we did a, a working group yes, last call. We, we did not. Uh, discuss that or do a hum for it, but it is not a bad question to ask. Okay. <laughs> then then as a, as, a, as a participant, can we do a working group last call on use cases? Yeah, I suppose as the author of the draft, it feels a little weird, but it was a collection of use cases I collected from other places. I think I do have some edits to do on that. Um, as So I would ask for the same for the same thing as Nick, actually, if I could have a look at it over the next few days and move to working group last call on it on Friday at the end of the meeting, I would be very happy with that um, as an author. Um, Randall, is that the cue? I, I also just, this is Randall Gellens, I just had a comment on moving to, well, on publishing the use cases because um, my recollection is that at the time that we pulled the use cases out of the, uh, um, the human language um, real-time draft and move them into their own section, own document. Um, my, my recollection is that we just said we weren't going to publish that as an RFC. Right, that was the original text. discussion, right. So right. that's, I guess maybe that's the first question is whether we should <laughs> reconsider right. that and, um, and then, you know, it has to be a document that you'd intend to publish before you'd work in group call. Right. <laughs> Um, yeah, actually, that's a that's a very good point. And I did Im I did imagine originally that it would be informational and helpful to the situation that we had at that time, rather than official documents. So if people are happy with that, then I'm happy to just clean it up and leave it as informational. Then that, I, yeah, that's yeah. that's okay. Well, maybe maybe uh, the appropriate thing would be to try to get a consensus of the working group whether that is something we even want to publish or not, right? Because it there's always a lot of work associated with publishing anything, right? And it'll take up working group time and et cetera. So does that make sense? Um, yeah, I, I support that. Let's decide first if we want to go through that overhead because my understanding was at the back at the time that we separated it out, we weren't going to publish it and we somehow slipped into this understanding that we would and I want us to just make sure we discuss that explicitly. Right. So uh, I guess before we have that, uh, does anybody else want to comment on whether they think it is uh, useful or not to bring the use cases to uh, publication? Does anybody else have any thoughts on that? Brian is <laughs> undecided. <Yeah. laughs> you can uh, give us Brian both Rosen. sides of your... Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, gener generally speaking, I think that it's helpful for history to know why things were done the way they were done because when people come along trying to solve whatever problem they have, they need things to, in, in order to look at to see why it was done a particular way. And use cases are really helpful for understanding why things were done another way. So in that sense, 
I'd like to see it published. On the other hand, this is a, a small group with, that has a limited amount of energy. We have two particularly useful drafts that I really do want to get done, and I'm not sure that's worth the work. Robert Sparks, the other drafts don't reference the use case document, correct? Correct. Can you hand the other drafts to a arbitrary person in the IETF, say some sector or gen art reviewer, and have them not knowing anything about the use case document at all, have those documents think that they would understand everything, understand the motivation for why things were built, or do you think that they need to be informed by what was in that use case document in order to be able to properly understand the documents? Um, my personal response to that, and I'd certainly like to hear others' views, is that I don't think you need to read the use case document to understand the applicability of, of the other one. I mean, I, I think you can understand what it can do uh, it, it might be useful to understand other things that people might want to do that aren't in the document, but but not for the not for the document. But certainly willing to hear other people's opinion on that. So, with what I'm hearing, I would suggest that you don't publish it unless the reviewers come back and say, "Hey, I, what's going on here?" And then you have to point to that document to explain it. Um, the ISG, as I was exiting, the ISG was starting to push back pretty hard against those kinds of documents, um, just because the extra work that it took at that layer. Um, so I understand Brian's point, but I, I, it, it sounds to me like you've actually moved the parts of that that are important into the other documents. Or more properly, left them in there. Uh, so I lost, this is Randall Gellens again, for anyone who forgot. Um, I just <laughs> wanted to, to mention that um, at the time that we did take it out, I think um, the understanding that we were proceeding on back then was that we would just do it as uh, publish the use cases as a uh, working group wiki page or working group web page so that it was very low overhead but it was there for anyone who wanted to look at it. Alexey Melnikov, um, I will actually second Robert's opinion is ISG doesn't quite like reviewing use case documents unless they're part of big something bigger or you know a section in existing document because there is a long there was a long discussion in ISG recently about documents which are not necessarily going to add value long term so but so if if you as chair as a collective as a working group want to argue that use case is absolutely necessary for you know to be archived in RFC series then I think our ISG can be convinced that it needs to be published, but by default, the preference is probably, you know, if you don't have hard feelings about not publishing it, don't then. Yeah, I think that's it. So yeah, we, we'll, we'll do that, um, send the other, uh, other documents through the process and then um, uh, go back to it if, if they flag it as the other documents not indicating that they're, what, or indicative of what they're trying to achieve. Great, cool, thank you so much for those comments, guys. Right, Guna, you are up. I'm gonna just put your slides up quickly. Okay, uh, go ahead, tell me when to change slides. Okay, and I also was in queue for commenting on the use cases. Uh, it was written as a kind of working document and each use case ends with a comment if it's, uh, feasible with the current wording of the draft and uh, there are some use cases that are not fulfilled. Uh, it, this information might be lost. We could check if we can comment in the draft itself uh, what is not covered in some kind of scope statement or so. I, I also agree that it is a lot of work to publish these cases as a proper document and we should look for other ways to do it. So that's just as you decided. Now for... Can, can I just jump in on that one point very briefly? Um, if we publish it as a working group web, you know, a page on the working group website, then it's not lost to history. It's all there. Mm. Good. Okay, 
let's go into the presentation of the real-time aspects. And next slide, please. Uh, we start with the discussion about the Lang STP attribute. I wanted to just give a, an overview of what's happening with that in its place. We have in the draft uh, a, a chapter five with a long reasoning about uh, the STP Lang attribute uh, and a conclusion that I see is wrong and that's why I feel that we shouldn't have such discussion, especially if it's not needed. Uh, what this discussion says is that uh, all declared languages must be used in the session. But it's much more likely that it is meant to be a list for selection and negotiation, and you can pick the language or the languages uh, you agree on to use. Um, I commented on this to M M Music for the RC4566 BIS in the M Music group, and they made slight small changes to uh, that document. Uh, they changed the importance to preference. So that it's clear. If you have a preference, it's quite clear that you want to do a selection from it. And there is also a couple of lines added. Uh, the events during the session can influence which languages are used. And the participants are not strictly bound to only use the declared languages. So it is what you agree on is the initial languages, but then uh, you can't uh, take responsibility for what's happening in the session. Uh, so the BIS, the BIS is not exactly as uh, it is in the current SDP, and it's more towards uh, interpreting as a list for selection. Um, However, maybe more is needed to really sort out how the current Lang attribute is supposed to be used. Um, but uh, we shouldn't discuss this further here in SLIM. Uh, the question belongs to M Music, and we should, anyone who is interested to have this properly settled for, at least for the BIS version of SDP, should go to M Music and do it. And we should really not document assumptions on this intention that uh, may be wrong or at least unclear. Um, next slide, please. So now that was a comment on the SDP, but now we go into our draft and start with the issues with the current functional scope within the current functional scope. So next slide. So returning to the Lang attribute and uh, section five, um, we I suggest that we modify this drastically, the text we have about the current Lang attribute. Uh, so that it just says that uh, Lang cannot be used because it does not support different languages in different directions, which is a thing that we have added and is needed for some use cases. So we should not, and we do not need to document any assumptions on the current Lang attribute uh, that may be wrong, that would cause, just cause problems. So the little section here is what I suggest to keep in chapter five, to say that uh, RFC 4566 specifies an attribute lang, which appears similar to what is needed here. We need, however, a more detailed specification than the lang attribute provides. We need a means to negotiate which language is used in each direction of the session. This difference means that the existing Lang attribute can't be used and we need to define a new attribute. 
simple and no discussion about uh, what Lang provides. Next slide, please. And then I think we are still nearly as unclear as you think some somebody thinks that uh, the Lang attribute is. Um, we have current wording that is fuzzy about the intentions with multiple language attributes. Uh, and we had an agreement in April that uh, something should be changed to be made more clear on this. Do we have echo in the room? I try to reduce strength on me. Is it okay? Um, yeah, you're okay. But yeah, okay, you're fine. You're, you're, you're fine. So uh, some, some small modifications are proposed in uh, our chapter 6.2. Uh, just, just one question, Gunnar. Yeah. So it says there's no, uh, uh, no requirement to use all specified languages, but it's not like the Lang attribute where you might use some other language, right? You, you have to, you don't have to use everything you negotiate, but you can't, can you still go and do something else completely different that you never negotiated? That's, that's out of scope, right? Uh, there is a statement in the draft saying that uh, the answerer is not bound to use the languages that were specified by the by the offerer, which I doubt. I think that looks strange, but I haven't commented on that. This uh, this discussion is rather make it really clear that we don't need to talk all the languages we specify. That we can do a selection and uh, just limit to one language. I say that I can do Swedish and English and you respond English and then we go with that. I, I don't need to use Swedish also because I originally said so. I, Randall, do you have a quick question? I, I just wanted to comment. Um, obviously, what we're negotiating is a, a technical capability, so we're obviously not going to be prohibiting user behavior. And the user be, normal user behavior is to only use one language. And uh, there are a couple of wording where it seems that you still want us to use all languages specified. Um, so, this section here is, there are two attributes, one ending in send and the other ending in receive, to indicate the language used when sending and receiving media. And we, the first proposal is to delete the yellow part here. So just starting with sending, saying that there's a send and a receive attribute. And then in the sentence, in an offer, the umintlang send values constitute a list of, in preference order, of the languages the offer wishes to send using the media and I suggest to change wishes to to is capable to select to change to send and similarly for receiving side so the user doesn't wish to send all the languages uh, he uh, specified from the beginning it is a list of what he is capable to select from so does that look feasible to try to erase all uh, uncertainties about uh, that it's really a selection and negotiation. Okay, next slide. And then we have some uh, things not clear what we do with languages in multiple media if we are 
in 6.2, there is this paragraph. When placing an emergency call and in any other case where the language cannot be assumed from context, each media stream in an offer primarily intended for human language communication should specify one or both human lang send or receive attributes. Um, this uh, intended for seems to that the user would like to use them all, but it is really an uh, alternative. So the intention may not be decided until the answer is received. And the answer cannot be composed if the reason for specifying languages is not explained. If it is an alternative, uh, then on what preference level compared to the language in other media? Or is it a complement so that you want uh, simultaneous use of the media? Um, so this is oh, we not, have a not clear. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Randall, do you have a question on that? So I'm not sure that I uh, am following Gunnar's problem with this text. The wording here is intended to differentiate between two broad types of media streams. One type is where you are using it for human communication in a language. The other media type is where you are not going to do that. It's just background information. You're not going to be talking over the channel. It's just providing audio, as an example. Or you're not going to be using a video channel for sign language. It's merely a background for the other party to be able to see what's going on in an emergency call, for example, the PSAP. That's the meaning of intended for human language communication, is to indicate when you specify a language attribute and when you don't. Right, but... Uh... And again, this, this gets back to my core point, which is that I think part of your um, objection to some of the material in here is based on a misunderstanding or at least a difference in understanding between uh, what many of us see as the intent of the draft, which is to um, specify uh, and to enable a technical communication and agreement versus user level interaction. We're not trying to dictate what the users do. We're not trying to dictate what the client presents to the user as having been negotiated and having been set up. That's not the, the, the intent of this draft. Yeah, but what the user needs is guidance for how to, firstly, how to answer the call. What is most preferred by the caller? If the Gunner. answering can respond to that properly, then uh, you have a good chance to start the call in a good way. Yep. Uh, Brian Rosen, um, I'm going to repeat what Randy says. This is a protocol mechanism for mechanical use. It is not an indication to users of how to behave. There's a fundamental difference. This is a protocol mechanism to use to direct calls, to make decisions on how calls are routed and what is presented. It is not how humans are supposed to behave. Big difference, and that's the part that we keep running across. It, exactly. So. What the UI does is completely out of scope of this draft. So as an example, if you have a UI where the user has indicated in preferences or in setup what languages and media are preferred in what order, and then that UI starts a call and uses the mechanisms in this document to set up multiple media streams and manages to get everything it asks for, the UI is not obligated to present to the user everything. The UI does whatever makes sense. If the UI wants to then present only a subset of those media streams to the user saying, hey, you got your, your preferred setup, what you exactly wanted, it's here, and you ignore the rest, that's the UI's decision. If it's not supposed to be reflected in the protocol communication. Right. And, and that's actually not that different from what's happening right now in this room. Uh, we have all these, we have video, we have audio, we have text. It doesn't mean that, you know, Randall now has to be typing in the chat room, right? Or has to be talking. You have all those capabilities, right? The user can use whatever they want. 
Yeah, but uh, the call, the call, the answer needs guidance, and uh, the, what we negotiate is very good guidance. Can be very good guidance for how to start the call. So and if you I want think to, we, uh, I think we somewhere say that the user shall be informed about the, the outcome of the negotiation. See, I, I feel that's out of scope of this draft. If you want to write a different draft that is advice to the, you, to the implementer of a client that's making use of this mechanism, that's fine. You can have that. That would be guidance for how to construct a user interface. But that's not the, should not be in this draft. I, that's a minor result of the negotiation is to convey it to the user and that is what is needed to complete the setup of the call. Well, I, I believe those are two separate things. You've got the call set up and you've got what's presented to the user. Well, usually you see if you get video and uh, that's part of the user, <laughs> the result of the negotiation, you set up video and it's apparent uh, in the user interface that you got video. And uh, similarly here, if we agree on one language, we can display it to the user. And the user has a good, a good hint on uh, how to start the call. Yeah, I actually am not sure that that's really true, right? You can negotiate audio and video M lines, but not turn on your camera, right? And you still have the M line. So I actually don't think that that's true in today's STP, Gunnar. Uh, this is Dave Crocker. I have not read the spec. I have no comment on the spec. I do have a comment because I always get up at the mic when someone says that an IETF protocol spec should say something about user behavior. And that is, we don't do that. When we try to do it, we do it badly. We don't need to do it. We shouldn't do it. Yeah. And this doesn't say how the user shall behave. It says that the intention is guidance to the user so that the call can be properly handled. Brian, Brian Rosen, no, we're not providing any guidance to users. We're building protocol mechanisms. The intent of the document is to describe a protocol mechanism for mechanical, for computers to do the right thing, not for humans to do the right thing. There's no guidance to users here. We don't intend to inform users of what to do. This is a protocol mechanism for mechanical, for, for computers or other, physical implementations of the protocol to do the right thing with the media and routing and all the other things that we do know how to do in the ITF. Dave Crocker again, I, I apologize. I was much too terse in what I said. What I meant was anything having to do with interactions with users is part of a specialty called user experience, usability, and any number of other terms of art. We don't have that expertise in this community. There are some individuals who do, but the community doesn't, and our specs must stay away from that domain. Let me attempt to put it really succinctly. It's a layer violation. You've got the what's going on between the user and the UI way, 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 way up above the nosebleed layer, and you've got what's going on at the protocol layer kind of kind of in the middle. That's what we're doing here. Yeah, but the language preferences are definitely what the user have input somehow, and it's now conveyed to the other side, and the other side is responding what the other user has for preferences, and it's very close to user interfacing. There's and that's the layers. That's that stuff, the filters down, the user has indicated to the UI, through the UI, in some way that's completely out of scope of this document, um, what the user's preferences are. All that stuff gets into the client, and then the client uses the mechanisms here to set up what's going to happen. And then the client informs the user in some way that's completely out of scope of this document as to what's happened. 
Yeah, this is Barry Lieber. Just to, to really drill down on that, this, um, the way you get the indication from the user of what language they want to use can be an explicit selection from a list or simply what store they went to to buy this product and, and what language it comes in. So, you know, trying to do anything more than saying you are reflecting a user's preference for language communication, anything more than that is, is, has got to be out of scope. Yeah. So this is rather a discussion of what what we need to convey in the in the protocol to be able to do the right decisions. And there is if we say, if we don't comment on the priority between media, we leave the, the result in doubt. What, what shall we use these uh, languages for? So, next slide. That's the next slide, isn't it? Is, is it Do you not see? Yeah. Didn't we have that slide for her? Did it not go through? Oh, no. Okay, that's next. Um, when reading the draft, I looked at this uh, section about advisory versus required and wonder if that is really needed. We have a notation with an asterisk that we can add to a language uh, tag and uh, if we have it we mean that the call shall not be uh, shall be uh, connected whatever the result of the negotiation is and uh, i wonder if we really should fail calls because of uh, not completed negotiations on language. Um, is it really realistic to ever automatically fail calls because of non-matching language indications? Um, you can have combinations you never thought of specifying and uh, um, they will work in reality. For example, Norwegians can uh, usually talk with Swedes Spanish people can usually talk with Italians and you never thought about uh, saying in the setting of the phone that uh, yes, I can receive Norwegian or Italian if you are from the other country. Um, so, Brian, do you have a question? Yeah. This, this, Brian Rosen, um, there are many reasons in um, protocol mechanisms to have Mechani failure mechanisms, explicit failing call. A great example would be uh, a, a SIP fork. You fork to four places looking for some uh, facility that can handle the specific languages you want. Three of them decline the call, one of them accepts the call, and you go to take it the way they w one that accepts it. You want a mechanism to, to, to be able to say, I cannot meet this specification, no. Um, I think that's a, a very useful protocol mechanism. I would like to retain it. The imp, any implementation can choose not to use that mechanism, but the mechanism should be present. Yeah, I'm not Randall get strict on this. I, I wanted to have. Oh, sorry, hold on, um, Randall has a follow-up comment. I just want to reiterate that last bit that Brian said. There's nothing in the draft that mandates failure of a call. Instead, all that that's in here is talk about preference for, for proceeding or not proceeding in the event of a mismatch, preference for. And in fact, the draft explicitly says that there are cases where a call will probably never be failed, no matter what, such as an emergency call. That's, we're not trying to force anything on people. Okay, I think Barry was going to agree there. Um, cool. Okay, go ahead. Google. Okay. Yep. Um, next 
So next slide. Um, then a couple of features that are not covered in the current draft is uh, a way to specify relative preference between alternative languages in the same direction in different media. Um, and a way to specify that two or more languages in the same direction are strongly preferred to be provided together. And we have discussed this many times before. And I have a new thing on the next slide. Uh, and that is uh, when we get into media that are not uh, using any of our Ta um, types, the main types, uh, video, audio, or text. For example, if we go into WebRTC and use STP for it, we need an additional construct. Probably not in this draft, but uh, that's work to be done to have a multiplexed uh, data channel to be declared as used for text, for example and we need to work on that so that we can use this mechanism also in WebRTC and other places where the media is not typed as video, audio, or text. And uh, there are mechanisms to use for that. DSCA attribute in uh, SDP neg is useful for the WebRTC case. And next slide. And that's it. We have a comment from Randall. Um, we go back to the first two slides, because I didn't respond to those directly, I think. So actually, I think we did talk about this, right? I don't remember now. Uh, you mean about? Delete. Oh yeah. So this. So yeah. If you if you look at the changes in the draft, if you look at what's actually in the current version of the draft regarding this material, um, uh, what's there now is a very small statement, and then a, a parenthetical aside about it says that the. Um, uh, interpretation of the authors of the draft. So I don't think there's anything in there that constrains any future revision of the of the document of, of the attribute at all. If in fact, if you want to project what's in the draft now, I, I'd like to hear if anybody feels that that should be taken out or that needs to be modified. Well, I do. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think we, it's wrong and should not comment on that. Okay, next. Yeah. I mean, as I, I recall in previous meetings, we did say that was an issue for the M Music Working Group. So, right. so um, I mean, what's what's in there now says um, uh, RFC four five six six specifies an attribute lang which appears similar to what is needed here. It specifies that a equals lang is declarative, which it does, and it says that multiple lang attributes indicate that quote media use multiple languages. And that, quote, the order of the attributes indicates the order of importance of the various languages in the ellipsis media, close quote. And then there's a parenthetical aside that says we, meaning the authors of the draft, interpret this to mean that the media contains all of the languages indicated, blah, blah, blah. For example, a video of an interview by a person speaking one language, of a person speaking another with subtext in the language of the interviewer, blah, blah, blah. Um, so well, the, the interpretation is what we said needed to be done by the M Music Working Group, not this working group, right? Because it's not our draft. So yeah, that's, I but think, what's going to This is just providing, to. okay, at the time that this, this document is, is written, the one that we're talking about now, we're going by the publication of the specification of the attribute that's there now, and we're just saying why we can't use it. But it's yeah. a wrong, wrong conclusion. Behind it. It's and not the wrong conclusion at all. It's a perfectly valid conclusion. <laughs> I mean, well, uh, I think the point is uh, the point here is that we agreed in this working group that that decision would not be made here. Well, we're this not was, making a decision here. We're not trying to say what the language, 
Well, what it we, really means. Now, previously, we had a consensus that this discussion of the interpretation of 4566 would be made by the working group that owns the revision. Sure. Okay. So that's, so Why your assertion that, 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 that we already decided that, that okay. that would go there. So, you know, it, it, arguments about interpretation of a document that's owned by another working group probably isn't right, the right thing to be doing in this working group. And I provided a simple alternative to, so that you still can invent this new attribute. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, the overall point was that that discussion should go to M Music. So probably having that debate here probably. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, so in, in which case, although the topic is extremely interesting, I'm sure, but there, um, that needs to that needs to go, and we could probably close up the debate with having it. Here. Yeah. Um, all right. I mean, I think probably the less said about the existing one, the better. But we do need to say something to indicate why we're not using it. And I'm not sure that Gunner's text is. is necessary, but perhaps we could say even less. That might be good enough. Yeah. Okay. So then there was one more slide. So just to reiterate what Brian said, we'll take it to the list to have this discussion. But yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, it probably would be best if it, I, mean, I don't like cross list posting, but um, I guess their music probably is the best place to take it to. Yeah. I mean, one thing um, is I, has this, has, all of this gone to M Music. I don't think, Gunnar, you didn't post all of your comments there, did you? No. No, so I, I very, think that's very small. You know, yeah, so I think really we do need to actually bring it there, you know, in, in toto. Brian Rosen, what I suggest is that we have a discussion on list of alternative wording to what's currently in the text. Right, for, on, which, our, right. on our list. On our list, okay. When we conclude that, we should take whatever language that is and bring it to M Music and saying, our document proposes to say this. Are there any comments? And let's see what we get. And I, very quickly, I think we can resolve this particular slide because uh, I didn't comment on this when you presented it. So your objection really is the wording uh, where that says wishes. And so if we change wishes to capable, is capable of, I don't like is capable to select to, because to me that doesn't make sense. But we can just change wishes to send, or wishes to use to, to say is capable of. Yeah. That's probably good like enough. Great. OK. Thank you, Gunnar, for that. Um, I'm going to press the big red button again. Okay, who knows what magic the red button does. I thought it was getting rid of things and putting things. Oh, it's oh, Gunnar's also on the list, so it's just putting you back in there. Okay, right. Um, I, I, I hope you're done. Okay, Gunnar, add yourself back to the list if you do have anything that you want to say more on, on top of that. Um, sorry. Okay, cool. Uh, we're at any other business. Uh, I'll, I'll wrap new work into any other business as well. I, I'm the future of this working group is, you know, uh, right now to complete the, the, the two documents to go through the RSC process with the two documents that we have, and then probably wrap the group up. So I don't know if there is any more work for us to do. This might be a discussion for the list, but you can feel free to come to the mic and make a comment. Yes. Hi, uh, Tom Gallagher. Um, I just wanted to point out, mentioning the uh, use case document from earlier, uh, there's a section there about security considerations. Um, Nick, I'm not sure if you were planning on incorporating those, but if that's not going to become, uh, if that's not going to go to final call, then that section uh, does seem relevant to both other documents mm. so that it would make it into one of those just so it can be part of the. Okay, cool. Thank you for that. Um... Can't just remember to right clarify, now. do you feel that the current security considerations text in the two documents is insufficient and needs additional material? Uh, I just feel like the security considerations in the use case document isn't mentioned in those other two documents. I, I don't know enough about the what's in the, the two mm -hmm. other documents that are going for final call. I, just, I like the text that's in the use cases document and would love to see that 
make it somewhere else rather than to go away. Uh, this is Nick. Um, I haven't seen the security considerations in the use case document yet, but I will take a look today. And uh, yeah, it's very it's very short. Just a it's a if it, it, it's almost a fingerprinting type of thing that you're able to understand a little bit more about the user, their preferred languages. So you could probably guess at their nationality, that kind of thing. Um, okay. Yeah, privacy right. related issues. Yeah, actually. Um, I do recall that one of the, the security AD actually mentioned that he was concerned about that text. So uh, anyway, that's something to bring up, I think, during working group last call. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, brilliant. OK, so uh, this group will then work towards completing those two documents and moving them in, If you uh, moving them up to the RFC chain. Uh, if you have uh, comments on new work that can begin after that, then please make it. But I will state that the, the goal of this group was to complete those two documents. Um, does anybody else have any other business? Great. So uh, just to say thank you to Brian for scribing and Lucas for being our Java scribe. We and Randall and Nick and Gunnar for being our presenters and Randall and Nick in particular for writing the drafts, uh, much of the work of this group. Uh, we have a lot of ADs here, past and present. Thank you for attending. Um, and if anybody has not completed the blue sheets, please come up to the front to write your name and company onto the blue sheets. And now you are all free to go about your merry way. Thank you so much, everyone. And do stay for the iMeeting boff in 20 minutes. Oh, an iMeeting boff, 20 minutes. Uh, yeah. In this room. So, yeah, if, you're not, if you don't want to stay for that, you do need to leave. But if you do, you can stay. What, what Pete and I are on about with, uh, with the hot stuff and whatever is that um, establishing consensus yeah. is a question of addressing objections. Yeah. So and so I'm if too. you focus on who has objections rather than yes, no, yeah. but usually you don't have to ask the yes question. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. you do. Yeah. But usually you can just call for objections and then when people hum for that you yeah. say please can you explain what your objection yeah. is and let's try to address it okay cool no thank you for the tip thanks um yeah so i'll We're give you a perfect yes. yeah that's fine this is perfectly good to have recorded uh in one of the working groups uh that i had when i was in ad yeah they, there was some there was an issue that was being discussed there were four options